I'm Richard Wilson, and I'm here to say a few words about Program 11 at the Bard Music Festival. My favorite anecdote about Nadia Boulanger involved her teaching at an American institution. It could be laundry school or Peabody Conservatory, doesn't really matter. And she would typically tell the students that while she initially thought they had musical talent, she had come to question that. They had disappointed her. Typically, the students would be reduced to tears. And then at the end of the semester, she would give them all A's. When questioned by the dean, she said, I did not want to discourage them. In the few encounters that I had with her, I was never her student, I observed the power of her look. On one occasion at Fontainebleau, she managed to glare witheringly at a poorly performing clarinetist, while at the very same instant scowl at listeners who were having trouble maintaining proper decorum. As many have observed, she treated her students almost as family members who needed guidance, not just in music, but in all aspects of their lives. Now those composers on our program who were officially her pupils survived and benefited, each in his or her own way, from her teaching as well as from her scowls. Now before I go further, I want to mention the term neoclassic. To quote Boulanger's early pupil, Walter Piston, composers, he's speaking of the group active in Paris in about 1925, Composers never said they were writing neoclassic music. They knew that if it was neo-anything, it was neo-baroque. Bach was a huge influence on Boulanger's teaching, especially in classes in counterpoint and fugue. Clarity of line, cleanness of texture, lively interaction of voices, syncopation created by the shifting accents of lines interacting, with a steady pulse. These were high on the list of her ideals in teaching the basics. I could add parenthetically that wit and economy are often mentioned as features of neoclassical music, in contrast to dense, lugubrious, self-important German repertoire post-Wagner. I'm saying that from the French perspective, obviously. When it came to Boulanger teaching composers, she could be very, very open. Piston remembers showing up one time with a page of stems and rests and beams and clefts, but no note heads. She didn't show the slightest hesitation in entering into a discussion of the pros and cons. She was, quote, nothing less than uncanny. I'll mention first George Walker. His piano sonata number two was composed as doctoral dissertation at the Eastman School, and it was written before his studies in Paris. But it's not hard to see what Boulanger found attractive in his music. The sonata begins with a motif at one rhythm and pace in the right hand, while the left hand gives a transposition of that same motive in slower, steady values. Reflecting, she may have thought, an acquaintance with Bach fugues, and thus a grasp of contrapuntal thinking. Here's the motive in the right hand, and in the left hand, the steady values. Put them together. Let's hear a bit more of Walker's Sonata, and it's going to be played by his sister Frances. Roy Harris is short Takata about as neoclassical as you can get, displays shifting accents and meter at the opening. And then, after a bit, a fugato. Boulanger 
Boulanger was seriously concerned with teaching music to children and once in 1925 even considered publishing a method book with appropriate exercises. Zygmunt Majewski's piano preludes, well worth adult attention, certainly appeal to the young also. Thea Musgrave's The Man in the Moon is even more clearly intended for the young. Maurice Lindsay's words are, the man in the moon's got a crick in his back so he will not come out to play. He sits by himself on a shimmer of heaven and hears what the stars say. But his cheeks go black, his furls his brow, and his old head shakes with rage through the bustling clouds that jostle the earth when God's on the rampage. Boulanger encouraged composers to be themselves, which may have meant don't forget your roots, or possibly even follow your predilections even you, if you think I won't approve. Karl Hus's charming song for dancing is a folk song from his native Czechoslovakia. The text in English is, if the farmer did not have such a pretty daughter, there'd not be so many boys around to court her. If the farm had gates of steel, gates of steel from Steyr, I would still jump over were they ten times higher. I would still jump over were they ten times higher. If the farmer did not have such a pretty daughter, there'd not be so many boys around the two quarter. There'd not be so many boys around the two quarter. The Argentinian Astor Piazzolla's Tango Etude No. 3 for solo flute establishes neoclassical credentials at the opening with shifting accents and a steady beat, but we don't have to wait long for the sultry mood of the tango to prevail. And then Mark Blitzstein seems to have studied briefly but happily with Boulanger in Paris before studying briefly but unhappily with Schoenberg in Berlin. Clearly, N.B. thought well of Blitzstein because she selected him to join her at a second piano in a performance of Albert Roussel's opera Padmavati. In 1935, nearly 10 years after his intense months in Paris and Berlin, his predilections having led toward the popular idiom, and now in the middle of the Depression, he composed the love song Stay in My Arms for his wife, who, alas, would die the next year of anorexia. He wrote the words himself. The refrain is, the world's gone crazy, so stay in my arms. Two years later, he would become famous for The Cradle Will Rock, a play in music directed by Orson Welles, and produced by John Houseman. Pretty good company to be in. Here's a bit of the song. Let's just be old fashioned. Let's just be lazy. The world's gone crazy. Michel Legrand, who entered the Paris Conservatory at age 11 and stayed seven more years, studied conducting with Boulanger. He went on to write over 200 film and television scores. Among his hits was The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. His song Paris Violon celebrates the power of music as well as the city of its title. 
The first line, La Rue de la Larpe, gives us a clue to the lush instrumentation. La Rue de la Harpe et la Contrescarpe à l'heure où le jour se fait vieux. David Conte, who was born in 1955, is the composer on our program who most recently studied with Boulanger, a longtime professor of composition at the San Francisco Conservatory. He has written some 150 works, including six operas. His work with N.B. from 1975 to 78 in both Paris and Fontainebleau was one of her last pupils. On our program, is his exuberant setting of Siegfried Sasson's war poem, Everyone Sang, published in 1919, possibly celebrating the end of World War I, or alternatively, depicting entrenched soldiers keeping their spirits up in the face of adversity. Everyone suddenly burst out singing. Of the various composers associated with Boulanger's famous early American class, that meaning Copeland, Piston, Thompson, and so on, Roger Sessions, who was not formally her student because she regarded him a pupil of Ernest Bloch. Roger Sessions had the most experience with and interest in Schoenberg's music. He had played a number of the piano works, such as Opus 11, Opus 19, well before coming to Paris. His recently discovered adagio from 1947 is fairly chromatic, but retains to an extent the common Baroque texture of two duetting upper voices over a bass. Here's an excerpt. Elliot Carter, who was definitely an official and devoted student of N.B.'s, went through a fairly consonant neoclassical period, but by 1950 he was composing in a freely chromatic atonal idiom, although never strictly twelve-tone. Enchanted Preludes is allegedly a conversation between husband and wife. You will see from this excerpt that, at least at the start, the flute doesn't let the cello say much. Anyone familiar with Philip Glass's music may be surprised to know that he once wrote twelve-tone music a la Webern, that he experienced Boulez, Stockhausen, Berio, Cage, and Feldman while studying in Paris with Boulanger, influenced by Samuel Beckett, for whose stage works he wrote music, Ravi Shankar, with whom he col collaborated on a film, Steve Reich, whom he met back in New York City. Well, the result of all of that was that he rejected total chromaticism, became more and more consonant in his music, which significantly took repetition to a new level of importance. Like Reich, he found that a series of nearly exact reiterations of a passage given in an insistent pulse could become interesting if small changes of detail were added gradually and cumulatively. The result was a music that sounded different from the mainstream modernist works of the 60s and 70s. It's a style commonly called minimalism. His 1976 collaboration with Robert Wilson, Einstein on the Beach, parodied by Peter, Peter Schickele as Einstein on the Fritz, is an acknowledged landmark. Here's some of string quartet number three. Adolphus Hailstork in his beautiful adagio for strings, exhibits a hint of minimalism in his slowly evolving texture, but without the motoric pulse. 
His music is poised between consonance and dissonance. Unlike Carter, who in his quartets treats the four players as individual personalities, Hale Stark plays with the rich sound of all four combined together. Here's the opening. In the collection of essays, Nadia Boulanger and Her World, Kimberly Francis's contribution called Boulanger and A Tonality, A Reconsideration, surprises us, or at least surprised me, uh, with the information that Nadia had a collection of scores by Pierre Boulez, some of which she annotated marking the appearances of the 12-tone row. For that reason, we include Boulez in this program, although he was certainly never one of her students. His early piano set, Notation, displays a 12-tone row right at the start. Well, those are the first 11 notes of the 12-tone. The 12th note will come, but only after this unreachable chord. In more than one subsequent movement, and there are 12 of them, each 12 bars long, we find repeating bass patterns. I'm going to look at number seven here because its bass pattern is fairly simple to grasp. It's just two chords, which repeat. And above that is a line that has a little dialogue with itself. It's a loud part and then a quiet response. So Boulez does not depart entirely from neoclassical practice, even though it sounds as though he did. I started with an anecdote and I'd like to end with one, again from Walter Piston. He remembered hearing Schoenberg's Wind Quintet about 1925, quote, now quoting him, at the end of it, the clarinetist told me he had five measures left over when the others stopped but he thought he had better stop too. That was Piston's sly way of telling us what he, and probably they, meaning the other Boulanger students at the time, thought of Schoenberg. I know you're going to enjoy Program 11. <laughs>